So this this short video um, that we're going to uh, watch today is about fleas, and it summarizes a little bit to give you an idea um, uh, of how bad are fleas and what kind of fleas are available, so that when we walk through the slides, you get a much more clearer mindset um, of the fleas. All right, so here we go. The Black Death was one of the most devastating pandemics in human history. Between 1347 and 1351, it wiped out 30 to 50% of the entire population of Europe. And if there's one animal to blame, it's likely infected fleas, making them one of the deadliest insects in history. Now, of course, fleas no longer kill millions of people. But as it turns out, they still transmit plague, they're still a nuisance, and they're still incredibly difficult to kill. Fleas are one of the oldest pests on the planet. In fact, primitive fleas were dining on dinosaur blood about 165 million years ago. And they're also one of the most abundant. Today, there are more than 2,500 species of fleas across the world, like the cat flea. Those are the ones you're most likely to find feasting on your dog or your cat. And then there are species like the human flea, which actually seek out human hosts specifically. And seeking is a flea's specialty. They can sense your breath, your warmth, and even the vibrations of your feet. And when they find you, they do what fleas do best, jump. According to one study, some fleas can jump nearly a hundred times farther than the length of their body, which would be like an average man jumping at nearly 175 meters into the air. The secret to their spring is a stretchy protein in their legs called resolin, and it works like a rubber band and a slingshot. They have kind of a hook and latch type of system, and when the flea lets go of the latch, they just poop. Now that makes fleas difficult to capture and kill but it's what they do once they land that makes them a truly terrifying pest. First, they use blades in their mouth called maxillary laciniae to tear into your flesh. Then they use a straw-like structure called an epipharynx to slurp it all up. It's not unlike... If you spilled your drink on a table and you took a straw and you tried to drink it up. Yum. Adding insult to injury, fleas have proteins in their saliva that keep your blood flowing, so they have a constant supply of food. And that's actually why they itch so much. Your body, or your pets, is reacting to those proteins. But there's one flea that takes feeding to another more horrifying level, and unfortunately, it prefers to prey on humans. Tunga penetrans, aka the Chico flea. Instead of drinking blood from the surface of your skin, the females burrow into you, and then they start laying eggs. Most of her is buried into the skin, but the kind of the back part where she's releasing eggs is exposed. And fleas lay a lot of eggs, up to 40 each day, and as many as 2,000 in their lifetimes. So if your dog brings back a few fleas from the park, you could soon have thousands. And the truth is, they can do a lot worse than make you itch. You see, even modern fleas can transfer diseases like typhus, bartonellosis, and yes, plague. In fact, in the summer of 2019, the discovery of prairie dogs infected by plague-ridden fleas shut down parts of a Denver suburb. And in 2015, a teen reportedly died from contact with fleas infected with bubonic plague. Now, fortunately, fatal fleas are pretty rare. And most likely, it'll be your pets, not you, that have to deal with them. But if you do see one or two jumping around, you definitely should try to get rid of them. And here's how. First, identify the source. And if it's your pet, treat them with an insect growth regulator, like lufenarin. Next, clean your home, though you might want to steer clear of flea bombs or foggers. They're inconvenient and don't always reach the nooks and crannies where fleas are hanging out. Instead, repeatedly vacuum or mop your floors and toss any bedding into the washing machine, making sure to dry it at high heat. After that, all you can do is sit, wait, and hope that you're flea free. All right. 
So that, I hope you managed to see that part of the, um, the video and summarizes uh, part of the conversation we're going to have today related to, to fleas. And after that, we will start the presentation. So most of what I'll be talking about will be around other fleas and, and their structures and the features, just in a little bit more details than what you've you've seen in the in the video that has just passed. So the outline will be we'll have the introduction, we have some classification of fleas, we'll have the geographical distribution and habitat of these fleas. Uh, we'll discuss some external morphology of the fleas. Uh, we'll discuss also the life cycle medical importance of fleas and prevention and control measures of these, um, of these fleas. So fleas may be involved as a vector. As you've seen, it can contain uh, um, some different bacteria causing like salmonella. Uh, they can be causing um, dysentery or bacteria causing utilaremia. But then it is important for public health workers to, to become familiar with the few species that attack man uh, domestic animals, rats, and certain wild animals. And this is important because the, apart from the flea uh, being a nuisance itself, it also transmits um, diseases. And public health workers um, should know uh, what are the, these important uh, species. C can you, you can't hear me? Can, can you, okay, great. So you can hear me. Um, so I'm saying the public health workers need to know the importance of the habits and lifestyle issues of these fleas in order to make sure that you apply the most effective uh, preventive control methods. And, and if you know where these fleas stay and how important they are to clear with them and which infective, uh, effective insecticides are, are, can be used, it will help you to be able to control and prevent potential um, occurrence of uh, epidemics. So generally, there's, these are kingdom animalia, Arthropoda, Phylum, class and sector. They are Siphonatoptera, and the families, the three major families, the Polycidae, um, Lepso, Leptopsilidae, and Keratopsilidae. And these three are the ones that contain majority of, of what we're going to be discussing, but there are more than um, 200 genera, as you've seen, uh, the Xenophila, the Pulex, the Tunga, as you've seen, the Tunga penestrans, um, you see the Topsila and Nosophilus. And all these, um, among these, these 200 genera, the ones that I've just mentioned to you here now are the ones that will be of medical importance, whether they're infecting human beings, uh, or your pets in terms of gat, cats or dogs. And, and of course, there are more than 2,500 species all over the world, but we'll not uh, dwell on this. So the flea species, uh, they're known to prefer specific hosts, but the unfortunate thing is they're not really loyal to the hosts that they are, they are they're dealing with. So sometimes it, you might find a cat flea in in on a dog and it can happen uh, it happens so often so even dog fleas can also go to cats sometimes uh, and also cats fleas and dog fleas if they find a human being they also go to to can get to human beings but they normally prefer the particular particular host these other ones are just usually incidental hosts in case you find them so uh you have the ones that are Stenopalides felis and Stenopalides canis and those are the rat flea which are, these are Xenophila, uh, Chiopis, which were very much um, in, associated with outbreaks of uh, uh, plagues. Uh, if you remember in primary school, we were studying uh, Viroboto Apanya, Wanasababisha Tauni. So th that is um, Xenophila. And also we'll discuss a little bit about Pulex irritants and sand fleas, which are known as Jiga or Chiga or Chigo. This is Tunga penestrans. Tunga penestrans, this is your common funza that you can find in, in, uh, in most villages and places where hygiene is poor and there is, they usually prefer to spend time in the dust. But when they get into your skin, under the feet, uh, as you've seen in the previous video. So these are the major fish uh, fleas, dog fleas, cat fleas, rat fleas, human fleas, sand fleas. 
And they are usually, they soon as they have a cosmopolitan distribution, they're found all over the world. Uh, and they're major prevalent in, in um, plague endemic countries or regions. So this is a distribution um, of, this is a little bit outdated map, but you can see this is a distribution of places where you could find uh, there's, uh, there's, there's uh, fleas, including Tanzania. In southern part of Africa, Madagascar, Botswana, you can find them in Algeria, in, in the US a little bit, Brazil, Peru, and, and these parts of the, of the, of the, the world. But uh, plague, as you remember in the previous video, it hit, it was very hard hitting in the European countries back then. So they were worldwide distributed. Now in Tanzania, for example, places such as Tanga and Lushoto, there are studies that have uh, demonstrated presence of human fleas like purex irritants, which can cause plague. Uh, rodent fleas are also present, as uh, Anopsila keopis and Brasiliensis. Uh, they can also cause plague. And then there is Tunga penestrans, which causes Tungiasis, which is your common uh, Funza. And this is not only just Tanga and Kigoma. I, how many, I don't know, in the chat, can I hear in the chat how many of you have ever seen fleas in your home? Just, uh, you can write, that. yes, I've seen. And then uh, which region did you see them in? Is it Dar es Salaam? Is it, um, where is it? So let us let me see in the chat, what did you, if you've ever seen fleas in your life. All right. Yes, I saw in Kilimanjaro, in Morogoro, uh, in Iringa, in Manyara, Arusha, Bukoba, right, uh, in Kagera, um, Kigoma. Nice. So you've you've all experienced at least most of them. You've experienced, and based on this, this what you're saying, uh, saying now, Kigoma, Kilimanjaro, all these are places where you can find uh, even Tabora, Bakari. You've been places. So these are all these are different places where you would find um, uh, uh, fleas, uh, even in Tanzania. And mostly, is it from you would find them in is it sand fleas or dog fleas or cat fleas? Which one have you experienced more? Dog fleas. All right. Mostly it's dogs fleas and sand fleas. That we're seeing because dogs are the most animals that are uh, kept right dog and sand dog and sand great so that is that is true so we agree that um uh, fleas is is um is an issue and it is uh, available in tanzania and then now we'll start talking about pulex irritans which is a human flea this flea uh, also again is has nearly cosmopolitan distribution it attacks a wide variety of mammals including guinea pigs domestic dog cats rats and goats so this is an important fact for you to remember just because it is called a human flea it does not mean that it will not uh in, infest uh, it won't af affect other other animals so this is a potential question you might be asked the true or false question that um human fleas infect or infest only uh, fleas and the word that is used here is infestation not infection uh, you should be very careful the ectoparasites like fleas uh, uh, um, mites and other uh, species, they usually do infestation rather than an infection, right? So um, that's why we use the word infestation. So in the infestation can reach tremendous levels, especially when farmers share their dwellings with livestock or hold their animals in coral buildings adjacent to their home. I remember uh, going to my grandma's village uh, when I was younger, and we saw a lot, a lot of these uh, fleas. And it usually it was a common practice when you uh, when you have to wash your dogs, you use uh, um, this anti-flea uh, uh, drug uh, solutions to, to clean them. I don't know if anyone remembers the, the kind of uh, solution that is used, the name of that solution, you can put it in the chat. Um, so the cat fleas and, and, and the dog fleas, these are extremely common in cats and dogs and in many temperate or tropical regions like our countries, but also they can infest rats. It, it represents a great majority of fleas in human homes. And dog fleas is closely related to cat fleas and is very similar in its appearance and its biology. And you're going to see the differences uh, in this. And then the, the Xenopsila keopis, which is oriental rat flea, uh, which is the various, various species around the Xenophila and are found through Africa, Central Africa, Southern Africa, uh, coinciding with the distribution of rats. And these fleas is the primary vector of Yersinia pestis. 
right? Yersinia pestis, the white pestis, this is the one that is the agent that caused the plague that you've seen that is, uh, or is also known as a black death, uh, which plagued the world and killed almost, um, you know, huge proportion of people in the world. Um, and, and so this is the most feared one. Viroboto apanya na osababisha tauni. And it's not the, the, the fleas themselves, it's because the fleas are infected uh, with the Yersinia pestis. So another one, which is a uh, um, Nosophilus uh, fasciatus, this is a rat flea, common in rats also, but it spends more time in the host nest rather than the, than the oriental flea. So the difference is the one will, other part will be in the nest, the other one will be most of the skin. And they're very likely to occur on rats in underground with underground burrows. And, and this uh, nosophilus occasionally infects other animals, including mice and, and, and ground voles and carnivores, and occasionally can infest uh, humans. Tunga penestrans, uh, small fleas, inhabit the sands and beaches and soils, and is commonly found in human dwellings. A primary host are usually cows, pigs, and dogs, but may also be in humans. Due to its poor jumping ability, the most common location for bites is in the foot. And this is where you have uh, Funza and Okami Guni, Sana, because these ones can't jump as high as, um, as the other fleas. So um, this is another flea, this is called a stick tight flea. This is a small, it is angular headed species, which is widely distributed in the tropics and, and has uh, also semi tropical environment. It belongs to, to, to group of fleas that are known as tictites because um, of the female habit of using their, their mouth parts to anchor themselves to the host. So you will see here when you're talking about, the, when I'll show you the structure of how they look like, the mouth parts are very strong when they're coming to, to anchor themselves and holding tight, just like how ticks would do sometimes. They then begin feeding while waiting for a female, for a male to copulate. These uh, these fleas are found in fowl, can also infest a wide variety of animals, including dogs, cats, and, and, and rodents and birds. So I want to viroboto wa kuku. sana sana kwenye kwenye kuku and birds, foals. Um, and then, so we can discuss now the morphology. Uh, you've, you've seen the different uh, uh, species and 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 how they look like now we're going to look at the external morphology how they look like uh, into their bodies the body is divided in head thorax and abdomen as usual and these structures all the structures in the region in these regions are used for identification so starting with the head each different species have a significant characteristics uh, that differentiate um, them for uh, helps them to identify them so for example Galinakeika and Tunga penestrans have a definite angle in front of the margin of the head, while most other fleas in front of the margin are very rounded. So let me see if we can get an image of this. Uh, second. All right, so this is an image of a general flea. And, and when we're discussing whether their heads are differently shaped, etc. So this is the this is a head. This is the thorax this is the abdomen the differences in the head the thorax and the abdomen will be used to differentiate uh different species let me go back so <clears throat> for for these two the most there's there's a there's a different angle in front margin of the head while most other fleas in the front margin of the head is evenly rounded so the tunga penestrans and 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 Gilly, Galinacea have a very uh, sharp angle in the front margin of the head. Uh, the, the dog fleas, which you see canis fleas, has a short head, while the face ones have long head. I'm going to show you pictures of this in a moment. So this is another, the, can, uh, the dog fleas have shorter head, while the cat fleas are longer heads. In many species, the head bear, uh, bears two or more dark teeth uh, below the cheeks, uh, known as a geniocomb, and you'll see here. Uh, so this is this is known as a geniocomb. This part is a geniocomb, and um, 
this is where you can find uh, uh, that row of teeth there. A number and shape of the teeth in Geniocomb provide an important characteristic in, in fleas identification. So also the eye hair, which is also known as ocular bristle, is another key character that helps you bring in the front of the, the eyes of uh, uh, the nopula chiopis. And usually below the eye, it's, it's purex irritans. So let me show you here. So this is the uh, ocular bristle. And if it is, uh, let me delete this. All right, so this is the ocular bristle. The position of this ocular bristle is going to help you identify different, uh, different species. Okay. And then um, in the thorax, this is a second body division of the flea. It is bearing three parts, which is legs, but no wings. As you've seen in the previous video, if you remember, these, uh, these fleas are known to have lost their wings so that they're able to move around in the, during evolution, they lost their wings so that they're able to move around in this, the fur skin of, of, um, of their host. It is divided into three parts, into prothorax, mesothorax, and metathorax. The upper part or the dorsal part of the uh, thorax is called the pronoton, and the plate, that is directly behind, uh, uh, it is right behind the head. And the plate may have a comb or a pronotal comb, which is on its hind margin as in, in, in this other um, nosophila fasciatus fleet. So this is where you have the pronotal comb and the thorax. So these are all differentiating features um, of this, these fleas. Uh, and then, when you're talking about the thorax, it's the second segment of the, of the thorax, which is the mesothorax, uh, is, which has a lateral plate, which is uh, known as mesopleuron. Here we are. Let me get you that. This part is the mesopleuron. On each side, so they're directly above the base of the second, uh, second leg. And most species of fleas are, uh, and is, is usually important for, to help them for movement. So it's, it's strengthened by uh, internal rod-like thickening. And this is absent in few species like uh, Purex irritans and, and Galenaica don't have this. And it's used an important character in distinguishing these fleas from uh, the fasciatus fleas. So if you want to differentiate between fasciatus fleas and Galenaica and Purex irritans, you look at the absence or presence of mesopleuron. The posterior margin of the methosorax and the metasorax may bear spinelets, which are often used in distinguishing families um, of, the, of the fleas, right? So these are the spinelets that can be used to distinguish also flea and the last part of the thorax. Now, moving forward, we're going to look at the abdomen. This is the thorax, now the legs. The legs of the flea are composed of five main parts. The, the large flat coxa, a smaller trochanter, a strout femur, and the long tibia, and five segmented uh, uh, tarsus, or the foot itself. So these are the parts. These are the five segmented um, tarsus, and then you have a tibia here, and you have a femur, and you have a, a trochanter here, and you have a flat coxa. So these are the parts of all these the four parts are parts of the of the flea uh, legs, and all segments have spines or hairs of various sizes and and length that are useful in in identification. For example, the arrangements of the hair in the hind tibia are usually useful in separating cats and dog fleas, but other than the shape of the heads of these two species, you can differentiate using the the log the legs of the of the of this flea. And the last segment of the tarsus, which is the uh, it bears plantar bristles that are important in distinguishing species of fleas such as rat flea from squirrel flea. All right, so after this, I'm going to show you another uh, short film for you to be able to appreciate the, some of the differences uh, and how some of the important features when it comes to this, the structure of this. And when you will see, they have this uh, uh, back, light, back, for, um, back facing uh, spines. And all these are useful when it comes to the ability to not 
be removed uh, easily. So I'm going to just show you a short video right now. Sometimes, to get where you want in life, you need to go all out. Fleas need to get off the ground and onto someone they can exploit. That's bad news if you've got fur or feathers. There are more than 2,000 flea species, each partial to its own kind of creature. But the one you'll most likely cross paths with is the cat flea. Fleas are one of nature's greatest jumpers, taking a gigantic leap, almost too fast to comprehend. They're small and narrow, like a little sesame seed with... So you can appreciate the, the, these sharp um, uh, appendages that are on the scale. And these are useful when you're talking about how they move around in the fur of animals. Legs. Their fly ancestors lost their wings millions of years ago to help them slip through fur with ease. Fleas are tough to get rid of. Stiff backwards facing hairs catch on fur when you try to pick them out. Try to squish one. Nope. Their flexible bodies are armed. So the, some of the body parts we were talking about, uh, including the sharp row of teeth, you can see it here. Uh, you can see these other uh, segments in the thorax. Um, you can see these are the big uh, gecko of the legs and other parts of the abdomen moving forward. So you'll be able to differentiate different species by looking at these, um, these parts uh, of these animals. Armored with rugged plates called sclerites. Adult fleas only eat one thing, blood. This cat flea prefers cat blood, but in a pinch, it'll latch onto you too. They lay eggs that drop from the cat's body into its bedding. A few days later, they hatch and worm-like larvae wiggle out. The hungry larvae scavenge for food. Their favorite meal comes from mom and dad, adult flea poop. That's just semi-digested blood. Now who could turn that down? So larva on a kula chakula kuto up in a cocoon it makes from whatever dirt, sand, or other materials it finds nearby. A few days later, voila, all grown up. Now this hungry flea needs a warm body to call home. Its jump is super fast. A hundred times faster than the blink of an eye but it takes more than muscle to move that fast. The flea can compress itself like a spring, thanks to a rubbery protein called resilin in its legs and body. 
First, the flea pulls in its oversized rear legs and locks them in place. It squeezes and flattens its body, squishing the resolute and building up energy for the jump. Then it releases the energy all at once. The flea tumbles through the air, legs extended. With a lot of effort and a little luck, it'll land on its target and the whole incredibly itchy cycle will begin again. All right. So that is how you would see some of the other features that would be important when it comes to identifying and, and um, being able to uh, see how they work and move around. All right, now we can continue with our slides. So the importance of these fleas identification because they differ generally and therefore to know which species belong to which uh, uh, order and what kind of disease they cause these are important, especially for public health workers, to be able to differentiate um, these fleas uh, that attack man's. And the important species can be determined by use of a simple pictorial key. So how to use a pictorial key in identifying common fleas? You can use those with geniocomb or prenotocomb present, those with gen only geniocomb, uh, the prenotocomb present, or those with geniocomb and prenotocomb absent. This is just the most important quick things that you can figure out to discuss, to, to be able to differentiate them, right? So you're looking at prenotocombs and geniocombs. Are they present? And this is gonna help you to differentiate. So where are the geniocombs? This is a geniocomb. And where's the prenotocomb? This is a prenotocomb. These are two differentiating features you could quickly think around. Are they present or are they absent? And if it's if they're both present, um, you, you, you belong in one group. And then if the only pronotocom present is belong to another group. If they're both absent, belongs to another group. After doing this, this you know, choosing of, of whether or not these pronotocoms and, and the geniocombs are present, then you move to other characters that are in a similar manner, you walk all the way down to the key to find common names of particular keys. I think you probably have seen there's a, you know, there's pictorial keys in, in uh, classification. So, <clears throat> Another key, another characters that are useful is the number of teeth, the position of the comb, the shape of the head, uh, length of the labial pops, position of the ocular bristol, as I've told you before, the ones that are top of the eye or below, number and position of the plantar bristles, and shape of and coloration of the spermatheca. Spermatheca, this is, um, this is usually present in the, the female fleas that contain uh, the sperm. All right, here's, here's the, an example of a, of, a, of a pictorial key that helps you differentiate. So is the geniocomb and prenotocomb present? Yes or no. Here, only the prenotocomb present. Here, both prenotocomb and geniocomb are absent. Now, this is already, you've already grouped them into three major groups. And now, if you look at the, uh, in both present, how many, uh, how many uh, teeth do you find in the, in the geniocomb? Is it, you know, uh, five or more or four or less? And does it have eyes? Or it does not have. So no eyes, you have already gone to the mouse flea. Again, you go back. Oh, it still has eyes and has many teeth. Right, so let's go. Now you finish the, the geniocomb. How are they? Are they horizontal? or are they vertical, the spines? Again, so if it's vertical, it's rabbit flea. You keep going. If they're horizontal, you keep looking for something else. You know, how, how is the head length? Is it having a, uh, uh, you know, the head length is twice as the height or, you know, almost the same size? So this is, again, you do dog flea and cat flea. The same thing you'd go in differentiating uh, in if the ones have geniocomb only, or uh, only no genocomb or the ones that have um, absence of both. I hope you have understood uh, how to use this uh, pictorial key when you're, when you're differentiating these fleas. Okay, you can put questions in the chat and then we can continue later. So the general morphology um, <clears throat> of the fleas, uh, depending on whether or not they have 
or uh, you know prenatal combo only prenatal comb present this is a summary as a summary of uh, how you can classify so without genio comp and has uh, um, without genio combs or, or um, present you can fall to these three main categories only prenatal comb present these are the main um, categories that you have in identifications so and then this is when both genio combs and prenatal comb present these are the common species that you would uh, have Right, this is more pictures for you to see. Uh, junior comp present, uh, junior comps uh, absent, uh, and how they would look different, rat flea and uh, dog fleas. I hope by the end of this uh, lecture, when you capture a flea, you'll be able to identify what species they are. Um, this again, the differences. Who can tell me the quick differences they see between this, uh, the nosophilus and the pulex? What is, what is, present or absent in, in Pulex irritants? Let's see in the chat. Is the geniocom present? Yes, and then pronotocomb, also absent, right? See, you can see now the difference. Now you're able to sort of identify these um, uh, differences. Now the Tunga penestrans, again. Pronotocomb absent, geniocomb absent, you're looking for the eyes and these things, yeah? So the life cycle. Um, the life cycle of fleas, like other um, holometabolous insects, have a four-stage cycle, which is going to egg, larvae, pupae, adults. Uh, and uh, the eggs, they shed by the female in the environment, and the eggs hatch into the larvae about three to five days. And then they feed on organic debris in the environment, depending on the, on the species. Uh, for example, the cat flea, as we've seen, they eat the, the, the poop of the, um, the parents, which is, is partially digested blood. And then the number of larvae and instars among species, it varies. Uh, and larvae eventually <clears throat> divide, decides to form a pupa and a cocoon. And then it, uh, it, it evolves into, into being uh, an adult, as you've seen in the previous video of how they would form a cocoon of sand or pebbles around themselves before they evolve into adults. And the larva and pupa stages take about three to four weeks to complete. So imagine if you get, you see one flea now, and in a few days, um, they start laying eggs. And then the larva's pupa stages in three to four weeks, you have an entire army of fleas. So afterwards, other catch uh, hatch from the pupa and seek out a warm blooded host for blood meat. And the primary host for, for the cat fleas and the dog fleas, as mentioned, and uh, the ones of, for the rat fleas, we already said that Nofsilla keopis and the Pulex interant are the primary hosts for humans. This is the life cycle. Um, as you've seen, the, the adults, eggs, larvae, pupa, again, the cycle continues just like that. Okay, so the Tunga penestrans has a slightly different life cycle. Remember, this one is, is the one that is a bit lazy to fly. And the eggs are usually shed by the gravid uh, female into the environment. The hatch larvae into three to four, about three to four days. They feed in organic debris in the environment. And then the Tunga penestrans has two larva stages before it forms a pupae. And the pupae are in cocoons that are often covered with debris from the environment, sand of people. And the larva and pupa stages take about three to four weeks. So this is a, a different. Tunga penestrans has about two larva stages before it becomes a full pupa. And afterwards, the adults hatch from the pupa and seek out warm-blooded animals. Both males and females feed intermittently on the host, 
but only mated females burrow into the skin of epidemics. You've seen previously in the previous uh, video, I've showed you how these females are burying the skin of the epidemics and they leave, uh, they start to cause a nodular swelling. And for those who, who let's say by, by, uh, in the chat, how many of you have ever um, gotten Funza or Tunga penestrans? I've I have experienced uh, the Tunga penestrans. How many of you in the chat? Can we see how many of you have ever uh, gotten infested with Tunga penestrans? I've already experienced the Tunga penetrans. Plus from Rexons are most affected by these Tunga penetrans. Oh, great. So that's that's useful. So many they how do they feel when they infect you? Actually, it is really it's hitching. I mean, you cannot get even, you cannot enjoy the night. Most of the they, I mean, you get the itch around the night. You feel uncomfortable even to walk. And, and normally, like for us who are from maybe Kagera regions, Adans are actually affected with this Tunga penetrance. How, how do you how do you how do you deal with that? How do you usually remove that? The the mechanism of removing the, the Tunga penetrance. For us, we normally, for example, when you take a needle, fly your scales since one of the other means that we can move that to the penetrance. Mm. Also, yeah, we normally use needles, you move it, and also you can uh, use the kerosene. Oh, by kerosene. So, after removing, what do you do in the wound? With the wound? After removing. We just the... leave. Mm -hmm. after, after removing, I mean, we leave it nothing because we use the tool. So, we, I think we leave like that way. Only good done. So that is that is important to notice because the Tunga penetrance will be the lava. Ah, some of you apply mummy's oil. It's it, but you don't put anything. You don't know. Just the home treatment. We do. Okay. So some people, someone said Dixon says they put mummy's oil, and um, some people because you know you would leave. Ah, after removing your prime after tar. Nice. So that's how some people do. But I remember in, in, in when we used to remove them, you would take a hot knife and then you burn the wound a little bit. And the idea of burning the wound a little bit is because you want to kill the eggs that are still, you know, the many, many eggs. They lay almost 40 eggs a day. So it'd be thousands of eggs that are there. So you have to also deal um, uh, uh, with the eggs that remain after after you removed the the larvae. Ah yes, Amani Rusendela is saying kwetu likuwa na toko kutumia moto, same as how we used to do in the, in in our context. So yeah. So after penetrating the they they penetrate the stratum corneum, they bury into the stratum granulosum. Now you get to know the technicalities. And with only the posterior end exposed to the environment. And then the female fleas continue to feed, and the abdomen is extended up to about one centimeter. They shed around 100 eggs over a two week period, and then they die. And then they, are, they, they become, they shed, and they, they shed out dead skin. The secondary bacterial infections are usually common uh, with tungiasis. Uh, and this is, this is where they, they just only. Uh, get into into striatum granulosum, and they start laying the eggs there. So the medical importance they usually through bites the discomfort and irritation. Mainly, the dogs and cat fleas they spread plagues as we've already discussed. Uh, they have also wild cycles and domestic cycles, um, and and also the they can plague bacteria are usually transmitted can be transmitted in humans. By the flea bites, if the, the fleas bite you, the plague uh, bacteria, the resina pestis can be uh, get into your skin and the bite exposure may result into bubonic plague or septicemic plague, or there's a, a very uncomfortable um, uh, scenarios. And another context would be if you have in contact with contaminated tissue or fluid when you squish it. Um, and then also this is a form of exposure that can result in bubonic plague. Um, and, and also when you have exposure to infectious droplets, when a person has plague pneumonia, for example, and they cough the droplets containing the plague into the air, 
Now they can also, these bacteria containing droplets can lead to pneumonic uh, plague. Uh, there's also another um, other species uh, of diseases that are being transmitted, like typhus, murine typhus, or also known as um, uh, endemic typhus, transmitted by rickettsia typhi or rickettsia museri or rickettsia poazeki. You may have learned this in, in your in your microbiology. Um, these uh, also can sometimes in their cases, if you remember, when when we're discussing um, Dipylidium caninum. This is one of the flea, uh, flea tapeworms uh, of, of, uh, of dogs. So this is a flea tapeworm of dogs uh, like, um, that can be transmitted. Or we've also discussed Hemenolipis nana and Hemenolipis diminuta. These are also some of the tapeworm infections that um, uh, are transmitted by the, the uh, fleas. All right. So they can also transmit um, other salmonellosis, as I, I was as I was mentioning at the very beginning. Um, Salmonella enteritis can also cause uh, the so-called food poisoning disease. Uh, Salmonella is usually known for the food food, food poisoning. Meat and other foods can be contaminated and and cause uh, uh, salmonellosis. For example, with Xenocella keopis and and uh, fasciatus uh, can also deal um, can lead to these kind of uh, diseases. So it's not only just the nuisance themselves, but also all these diseases like salmonellosis, plague, robotic plagues, uh, tapeworm transmission, and all these are important. Um, we've already discussed the Tunga prenastrans. So transmission uh, is usually the female sand flea burrows into the skin and sucks blood uh, host before producing eggs. I mean, normally, Normally, when this we're talking about vectors and parasites, it's usually the female who's pregnant uh, that goes into eating, uh, you know, uh, sucking more blood uh, from from animals like human beings or cats or things like that. So it's a very common recurring feature when you're talking about um, vectors and 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 so vector parasites. So fleas typically live for about four to six weeks, after which the eggs are expelled and fall into the ground. The toes, the sole, and lateral rim of the foot are usually common sites that are affected. And secondary bacterial infections, as you've experienced that some people don't do anything, some people only put kerosene, and this is a risk of, um, of a secondary bacterial infection at the site of, of, uh, of a biting. You can have a swell, swollen region uh, that look like you have a white halo, which is very nicely ticklish. Several mammalian species of the, uh, can also act as reservoirs for these infections. An infection can be transmitted without animal reservoirs, especially uh, for the sand fleas, when uh, just the skin comes in contact with the with the, with the floor or the or the soil, so you can have ho homes that have these uh, fleas. So diagnosis for tunga penetrans, I mean, you don't really need a diagnostic test because you can do a clinical uh, diagnosis. You can see the the wound, and almost everyone can diagnose tunga penetrans even in the villages. So you don't really need a diagnostic test for Tunga penetrans, but it's most likely because the parasite is visible. And identification of the parasite is through removal and the patient's traveling history should also help to diagnose for diagnosis of tungiasis. And usually uh, the disease is, is self-limiting when you just do it at home uh, and, and you remove it. And, and, and someone said uh, that after you remove it, you just pray to God to don't get secondary bacterial infections, but if you get secondary bacterial infections, the wound can get uh, bad. But these are some of the antibiotics that you could use uh, for, for uh, after the extraction, or you can do a topical antibiotics. Um, so this is an example of uh, jigger infected um, Tungia feet. You can see these are some of the places where you would have them. They usually like at the corners of your, your toes. Uh, in the where the intersection of nails uh, and and uh, your skin happens because there's usually burrows they can get there and usually sometimes they like these places here. So tungiasis is one of the neglected tropical disease and I think it's a very interesting disease for you to do research studies on, but there's usually widespread and 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 some people think it was imported to Africa from Americas in the 19th century. But in almost all the sub-Saharan African countries, uh, it is prevalent. 
And this is this is another like a study of the meta-analysis uh, of giga fleas in, in rural western Tanzania. This was a 2012 study and the prevalence of tungiasis in in uh, in, in, in in rural western Tanzania was about 42 percent. Uh, and and the systematic review of uh, generally sub-Saharan Africa, you would see a prevalence of about 33 percent to 42 percent um, uh, in, the, in, in Tanzania. All right, so control. We've, we've repeated several times about this, but then the most important thing is integrated pest management uh, protocols, um, especially at the pet levels for dogs. Make sure you clean the animals. Uh, you, you can use using the different molecules that affect either adult or you usually kill the, the, the pupae. So this is typically achieved using adulticide to kill the adult flea. And an insect development inhibitor, like uh, as you've even seen the Lufero neuron, or insect growth, growth regulator uh, as uh, methoprene to prevent development of the immature stages, just like the, the larvae or the pupae that are inside the sand or the animals. So these are some of the um, controls that you need. But the most important part is to do an integrated pest control management that you only not only just treat the, the animal, but also the environment. Um, as I mentioned, these are the medications that are used. Uh, also, cedar oil is a non-toxic substance that have been used to prevent the eradication and infestation of fleas. Um, cedar oil is used in treating to, to treat sand flea infestation. I think there's someone mentioned in the group, Nixon mentioned mammoth oil. I think it's something similar to cedar oil uh, in this context. Um, again, within the context of, uh, of, uh, of fleas management, you could also kill the rats that come out in your home so that you don't live with rats. Uh, just make sure your home is clean. And then the solution, the kerosene or fuel, they can also help. Uh, as you've already seen in, in traditional knowledge, uh, people saying, uh, dogs and cats may be dusted with malathion powder, which is one of the common uh, uh, powders we use to for, for, for uh, washing uh, dogs and cats. Also, you can do insecticides and, and making sure that people wear shoes. So it's something as basic as providing people with good homes, with floors and, and, um, uh, and, and shoes can help prevent uh, funza. Uh, so in epidemics of plagues and typhus, you must make sure you kill the fleas before you engage um, the rodents, because these are much more important. All right, so that's that's all that I wanted to share with you when it comes to fleas. Um, and if you have any questions, now you can put them in the chat.